Hey, yo, Gawain, you hiding something, bruh? Thank you to our final patrons, Strawbones, Red Wolf 4765, and Midnight Gem Lord. Now, before we come to this breakdown slash review of chapter 85 of Fortnite of the Ap 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 Apocalypse, please leave your leave on this in the chapter in the comment section down below. Leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, make sure you hit that little notification bell so you miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Also, also, I do have a Patreon down below where you can support for as low as one. Count them one dollar a month to give you exclusive videos, early content, and more. Some of that exclusive content, including the live reaction to this very chapter. Now, let's hop into the review. What's up, guys? I'm the Pencil, and here we are to do a breakdown and review of Chapter 85 of Four Nights of the Arch. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> With that being the case, let's hop right into it. So we open up, and we do get to see that um. Percival makes the most unbelievably astute, profound, and legendary observation as he stares at a mountain with a hole in it and the land with holes in it. And he says something that we could have never, never, never gotten without his unbelievable, insane in the membrane, next level insight. Bro says the mountains and land are completely gone. Percival. <laughs> crazy bro i knew my eyes weren't working <laughs> that's why i have to use audiobooks i'm actually blind but regardless <laughs> we do get to see that apparently the reason this mountain disappeared is because there was some prime quality ore in there some good stuff some good stuff how do you knew that i don't know like i i don't know if there was a mine in this mountain beforehand but i guess there was or something like how, that is how did you know that <laughs> Can you tell? Did, did a giant tell you? Did Diane send that along with a rock she was playing to send at Leonis a couple chapters back? Like, how do you know? But regardless of that, we do get to see that apparently this entire region was just beautiful, gorgeous. It was surrounded by lush forests and lakes. And there were small villages here, such as Igor, Seblon, and Ordon. And apparently Ordon, as we know, as I should have known, I should have needed this point out to me about Meliodas, but shout out to Meliodas, this actually was the hometown of of Pelio and you know where Gother was kind of hiding out for the past well not now but in the previous series for the past 16 years that's where bro was pretty much chilling so it's interesting to take a look and see the ramification of Arthur and seeing how it's affecting the world affecting characters we know like obviously Pelio's home village was taken because that's something that we can have ties to. We know Pelio. We understand Pelio. We've seen his development. We've seen his glow up. We've seen everything that Pelio said to do. So now this like existential problem is given real personal cost. Like I hope Pelio is all right with his whole family disappearing. Cause that seems like that's essentially what happened here. And notably with this chapter's context, I'm not sure if these people actually ended up in Camelot or just straight up disappeared, but let's take a look. We do get to see, that as Percival's like a nani daisyeskino, Sir Pelio, he looks over the massive missing hunks of land and is like, how, how could he do this? And um, no lie. The more and more we hear about Arthur, the less and less I'm convinced it's actually him. Like, I don't, I don't know. It's like it's not like I don't have faith in Nakaba, but I don't have faith in Nakaba, so I feel like. There's going to be some twist around Arthur that you see secretly, it was never his fault. He was just under the influence and or being manipulated by and or possessed by and or and or and or and or and or. Like, for some reason, in my heart of hearts, I feel like Nakaba is just going to keep shifting the blame away from Arthur. At least in the long run. I don't know why. I do know why. I, I feel it in my heart of hearts. But regardless, with that being the case... The reason I say that Arthur may not even know in those humans from Ordon... Ig Igbor <laughs> and all the other villages that are disappearing and may not even end up in Camelot is because of how Thetis describes it. It looks like every time Arthur creates something in Camelot, something in this world is lost. Okay, that one <laughs> takes away my heart attack that I had last chapter because the, the main heart attack I had last chapter was like, wait, you're telling me the 16 years of chaos training, all the info dump you got and the massive amount of power you have, you can't create one separate realm? One separate realm? You know what your kids did? Well, are they like... See, like, what is the... Because this is different. Like, are the supreme deity, the demon king, and the great fairy tree now 
Arthur's stepchildren? Step creations? Because, like, I'm trying to think it. Because Chaos created them on his own with, or on their own. They're pretty much genderless. Chaos created them on their own before they fused with Arthur. But now Arthur is the king of chaos and is not fused with chaos. So are they technically his kids? Or does he like... I don't know. I just want to see... I just need an image of Arthur scolding the demon king for making a realm. <laughs> but regardless, the reason I brought that up is that before, in last chapter, I was like, wait a second. How are your own kids doing better than you, bro? Like your tree, the tree you made, made a realm on its own, seemingly with no repercussions on the real world. How are you doing this? But apparently, Arthur does not need to take ore or land masses or anything like that. It's just like he creates something and something gets destroyed. Like, like literally, the laws of Full Metal Alchemist actually apply when it comes to chaos powers, and that feels strange. I don't know because. It, at least it implies to me, from what I can tell, Chaos is still not under Arthur's full control. Like, at all. Because, once again, I'm going off the little teeny tiny itty bitty bit of information we got about Chaos and its kids. They didn't do this. They didn't need to do it. Or at least from what we know. Like... If there's a massive chunk of the planet just missing that we never get to see because we're always in Britannia, then maybe they did have to do it. But I don't know. It seems like the fairy realm, the celestial realm, and the demon world are all just self-sufficient. They never need to bother anybody. I made a joke about how it's pretty much impossible that a sun just drifted into another time space. T space, not time space. Drifted into another space. Sorry. Time space slipped out. But maybe that's actually what happened. I don't know. But that's what last chapter was implying. But it seems like, no, Arthur just can't help but take apart the original world when he's making this new one. Interesting. And note, once again, I'm all about phrasing. I'm all about words and stuff like that. Because Nakaba, he's a sneaky man. <laughs> Most mangaka are. But I say, if there's some sneaky men when it comes to wording and stuff like that, I'd say you get it from Gay Gay, you get it from Nakaba, and occasionally you get it from Horikoshi in terms of their wording. They don't say something in this world is used or something in this world is exchanged. They say something in this world is lost. Lost to what? Lost to where? Lost to why? The world beyond? That place that Lancelot and Jericho were in? Is that where it's lost to? Maybe? I don't know. Is it kind of like a Traverse Town situation where it kind of just appears and then disappears? Well, I guess, no, that'd be Camelot as a whole. Is it like the world of chaos, essentially? Like, this is not the world of chaos that we're thinking of in terms of Camelot, but for all our Kingdom Hearts fans out there, because one way or another, we got to relate it back to Kingdom Hearts. Remember in the end of KH1, the... No, it wasn't the world of chaos. That was Ansem's final form. The end of the world, that final level, which was essentially just an amalgamation of all the worlds that had fallen to darkness, is that where all of this stuff goes? If it's lost, not specifically used. Like, I would get it if Arthur was just like, hey, you're a town of humans, want to come with me? And the humans, under the influence of Arthur, are like, uh, yeah, sure, I'd love to see my dad again. Yeah, they would all go with him. But seemingly, the word lost being used here makes it seem like, oh no, these things are just up and disappearing. And like, Arthur doesn't even know that it's happening. That's what it seems like to me. But who knows? We'll probably get more clarification in the far future, because at least from my perspective, I don't think we're going to get much information anytime soon. But with that being the case, we get some ideas here, some more information. People ask, like, hey, wait a minute, you didn't see it for yourself? And Meliodas goes, no, but I heard from a credible source, so there's no mistaking it. And we see Tristan struggling to be professional. <laughs> Once again, I really, really, really wish we got to see more of young Meliodas and young Zeldris and how they interacted with their father. There's so much, so much about the 3,000 years past time that I just want endless more information about, but never going to get. <laughs> no matter what Nagama says, I, I'm never going to get. I'm still waiting for that supposed fight between Elizabeth and Meli that he said he was going to do that has still yet to happen, and I don't think ever will. But... With that being the case, be, I want to see it because I want to know if, like, Meliodas and Zelda's went through the same stage that Tristan's going through right now. Like, his father's the king, so he almost calls him Papa, but he's like, oh, f a father, being professional. 
I suppose referring to him as my liege or my lord would be even more professional. That's what I assume the kids had to do to their father when they were dealing with the Demon King. But, I don't know. So, so much interesting lore stuff that's kind of just up in the air. However, with that being the case, the main reason Tristan has even spoken up here is like, ah, oh, you know... Pops, let me love with you real quick. This information, this source, this stuff, it seems, uh, seems a bit crazy. Like, who on earth is your source for information like that? It seems so strange. And <laughs> Baliotis caught me off guard here when he said, Percival. And I was like, oh, Percival, a snitch? But no, <laughs> in fact, it's not Percival being a snitch. It's his grandpappy. So Vargis was the holy knight who once loyally served King Arthur that dropped every last bar on how the kingdom was functioning. He's like, you need this, you need that, you need this, you need that. <laughs> you need all this stuff. And that's how it's working. And we see that everyone is a bit bamboozled, obviously, because they're like, wait a minute. Percy, your grandfather was a snitch? <laughs> I can never rock with you now, Percy, because you're going to snitch on me. No, <laughs> they would never do Percy like that. Unless it's Kion. Kion would immediately do Percy like that. However, with that being the case, we do get to see that Kion. Who, like, in a roundabout way, I still would point it out. Kion is, in fact, Tristan's cousin and Meliodas' nephew. And I... And I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure if that makes, I think that makes me like him worse. <laughs> like him worse? Mate, it makes me like him less. <laughs> like, jeez. Jeez, Kion. But of course, he's being Kion. He's like, ah, yeah, ah, Majesty, why are you, sir? We can, um, trust, link the information from my filthy trainers. Can, can I, 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 I just don't think this is very, shut up. Kion and me. <laughs> Kinda hated that voice. <laughs> because that's the thing. It's it's wild, right? Because I have this I have strong emotions when I think of Kion because I just don't like him. But I still think he's a better character than Jade and I saw. Because <laughs> Jade is nothing. He's stupid and he's worthless. Like at least when I think of Kion, it's like, oh yeah, there's a character I have to critique. I can actually see a character arc from Jade? Nothing. I sold nothing <laughs> to voids of character. They might as well not even be in the darn plot <laughs> for how much development I see in their futures. Gosh darn it. Worth. <laughs> I gotta stop being so mean to these poor characters. However, with that being the case, Leota says like, now listen here, you dumb, dumb bubblegum built like a knockoff guilt and a look. <sighs> Sorry. My apologies. Forget you're my nephew. Yeah, I believe them and I still do. And Percival's like, um, hello, bro was up on the finger of the Lord with me since forever. When did he tell you? And Melita strokes his non-existent beard and is like, oh, uh, you see, <laughs> funny thing about that. It was actually right after the Holy War ended. And ironically enough, Melita is lying. Like, at least, it depends on what you define as the Holy War. Because, like, if you define the Holy War as the death of the Demon King, which is what I typically define it as, because, you know, both leaders were inactive, and the commandments were either dead and or gone. And on top of that, the literal war front, which was the demons, was called off at that point. Then, Meliodas being king here, kind of doesn't... I mean, this... Essentially, Melios being in his kingly attire here means this is post Curse by Light. Like, this has to be after Curse by Light because he is a king. He's fully within that attire, meaning that Percival, at least in this image, is likely a couple months old if he was supposed to be born immediately after the advent of the Holy War. Or not the advent, the end of the Holy War. But we do get to see that apparently, with this being the case, the reason Varghese ran away is because since he was a turncoat, he was being hunted by his former comrades. Everybody was out for his guts. And one thing I do have to admit, something that I I think I noticed in the one chapter we had him in, but I didn't necessarily put too much emphasis on, Varghese is massive. Like, massive, massive. Like, insanely ma Like, dude barely fits in the hallway. His, the range of his... Elbow to his shoulder is Meliodas's height, and Meliodas is five feet tall. Bro, what? <laughs> Why is bro so massive and gargantuan? Why is Ironside so small? 
<laughs> like Ironside doesn't have nearly as many gains as this man. What is going on here? But with that being the case, Varghese did not come alone. He did, in fact, have little baby Percival with him. And one thing I will admit, the story is just naturally going to struggle with making me care too deeply about Varghese. Like, I mostly feel bad for Varghese, mainly through Percy, because I know Percy and I don't really know much about Varghese. I think maybe a better way to, to, to make characters care more about Varghese and make the reader care more about Varghese is to have us have, like, maybe the first 10 or so chapters be about Percy and Varghese. Like, get us actually attached to the character. Because by the time he gets packed, I don't think chapter one's even over. Hold on, let me double check. Yeah, Varghese got packed up pretty early on, and I think that's just a detriment to the narrative. Like, I get it. It kickstarted our narrative. We need an inciting incident. Every story does. But with that being the case, I don't know. Like, it's cool to learn more about Varghese, but I feel like half of the emotional impact I'm supposed to be feeling just isn't there because Varghese isn't a character I know too much about. He's purposely shrouded in mystery, and I think that goes against whatever emotional investment I'm supposed to have in him. But with that being the case, it is still very cool to see Meliodas and Varghese interacting. And... Meliodas does get him all patched up and healed up because he was battle damaged. And we see that, once again, feeding to my ever-present fears of Arthur just not being there and not being a villain and not having to be held accountable for his actions. Allow me to repeat what Meliodas said. With his master Arthur changing by the moment after getting the power of chaos, Varghese hoped to turn him back to normal and stop his comrades who blindly followed him. So yeah, Arthur is an Arthur. I don't know. Like, un un see, the thing is, the reason I 100% believe we need some sort of flashback arc to this time or some sort of justification, if Arthur is to be our final villain, a villain, something at all, we need to somehow sit down and disprove that chaos has an influence on him. Because we thought there was a lot of discussion when the chaos literally popped out of his right armhole. I was like, yeah, chaos, you know, it's just a will. It doesn't really do anything. It's kind of like non-sentient. It doesn't think. So it doesn't really, not really have to worry about it. It's just going to protect me no matter what I do. But here, according to Varghese, one of the most loyal knights of Arthur, as we can see, he started changing the moment he got chaos, which at least implies to me either Kath or chaos had massive influence on him. If we had more hints that Arthur really... See, that's the thing. It can still hypothetically work. Hypothetically, you can make it so that Arthur isn't being influenced. It's just that with the new power he had, he started to think about all the wrongs that were done to him. And I was like, hey, you know, I really don't like the other species anymore. I'm going to get rid of them using this new power I have. And he slowly started taking more and more steps and descent really into this dark path this dark mindset of his which seems like a nice logical story to see but the thing is i need to see that story because at least right now from this vague explanation that we're getting from Meliodas, from what varghese told him it seems like chaos and very likely cath because you know destructive impulses is what really has sent arthur down this downward spiraling path and that makes it it makes it less interesting overall, I would say, if it is the case. Once again, this is not outright confirming that Arthur is not fully autonomous and in actuality is all good to go with his mental control and is just using chaos darker than he would have in the original series because he had some off-screen character development. This isn't immediately disproving that. But at least it's implying that. Especially with Meliodas' whole, like, I'm gonna save you, Arthur! It's like, okay, so there is an Arthur to save. The Arthur we're seeing isn't the real Arthur. It's an Arthur that's either been directly modified or altered by Chaos and or Kath, or is under some sort of control or influence. I don't know. Inherently just not as interesting a story to me. Like, Chaos and Kath are two characters who, admittedly, I just didn't necessarily care about. I like Chaos on a scaling front. <laughs> But from a character perspective, no. Kath being the final villain, I mean, it's he's been around for a while. He was around for a while in the original series. Yeah, but I don't know. Not very sad. Once again, I, I talk about this all the time. It feels like Seven Deadly Sins ending wasn't an ending for the series. It feels like it was set up for another series. That's why I think we have the time skip in the final chapter to Tristan, because we need to refocus back on Leonis and our main cast, because we cut away to Camilla and Arthur and all this stuff at the last second. But another video for another time. Regardless, Meliodas did believe Elizabeth. Meliodas did believe Elizabeth, huh? Meliodas did believe in Varghese and was like, I bet. So in order to 
seal the deal and prove that they are undying eternal friends. <laughs> I guess Meliodas just has this. I don't know. <laughs> Does he give this to everybody? I, I, apparently, he just gave him an Ouroboros medallion as a token of eternal friendship. You just got those? Like, I get it. The Ouroboros is your symbol as the dragon instead of wrath. And, you know, a dragon eternally eating itself. But, <laughs> I don't know. Like, it, it makes sense that it came from Eliotis, right? Because remember way back in, like, chapter 50 or so, when we finally got introduced back in Meliodas, he said, oh, yeah, I recognize this. This is the Ouroboros pin, and this is the helmet. And we see that for the helmet, he used his dark magic to leave two stars on the helmet as a token of trust and cooperation. The two stars on the helmet thing I get, you can just do that whenever. He literally lights his fingers up and goes, pss, 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 and then bada bing bada boom, that's good. But the Ouroboros medallion is such a oddly specific thing. I don't know why. It, it caught me off guard that he just has those ready to give out to the homies. Where's mine? But we're <laughs> regardless, we do get to see. And with that being the case, that finally explains what those things are to Percival, who kind of always wondered what those things meant. And we get to see that Meliodas was like, yeah, fun fact, I almost became your stepdad <laughs> because he had nowhere to really go. So I was going to look after you and I need that alternate. I will write that alternate timeline. <laughs> Let us say, because I'm not going to get that alternate timeline, but I'm going to write that alternate timeline where Percival and Tristan grew up as brothers. That's that's the what if. It's being canonized right now. I'm put, hold on, give me one second. I'll open a Google Doc and title it that. The Google Doc is open and it is now titled. So, <laughs> somewhere in the near future. Not in the near future. I'm working on another what if right now that is already 10 parts. But still. And somewhere in the future, do not be shocked, do not be surprised, do not be appalled if you happen to see a what if surrounding the alternate timeline where Meliodas actually took Percy. But apparently, instead of this alternate amazing mega timeline happening where we could have way stronger characters, way, I mean, we wouldn't have Nasins though. So would it be worth it? Nah, no, nah, I'm kidding. But with that being the case, Varghese apparently declared that Percival was his to protect, even if it cost him his life, which it did. <laughs> and apparently, Varghese was like, I'm going to raise him up to be a healthy, kind-hearted boy. It's my main goal, my main concern. I don't care what it takes. And we do see that Meliodas and I both agree that he definitely kept his promise. Ever since he saw you... Well, no, ever since Meliodas saw Percival, he knew that he did. And... <laughs> Well, this is right, because he kept his promise to the ultimate degree. <laughs> because it did cause Varghese's life, and Percival is a kind-hearted young boy. And that is nice, right? Like, once again, do I think I'll ever be emotionally invested in Varghese? No, bro's a pack already. The only, Actually, the only way, the only extra saucy way I could find myself getting invested in Varghese, I just thought about this, I still need to make a video talking about the Chaos Revivals, is just that if... Arthur brings Varghese back as a Chaos Varghese. Ooh. Ooh. On some Grandpa Gohan in the uh, Otherworld Tournament type beat. Ooh. Original Dragon Ball. Ooh. I love that. That'd be fire. That'd be fire. I like that. I think that's why you get me more emotionally invested. But at least for right now, not too concerned about that. What I am concerned about and what I do care about is how Percy, my boy, I can't call him best boy because he simply isn't. <laughs> he, he he can never be. But with that being the case, my boy Percival, he breaks down in tears. He's like, <laughs> yeah, my pops, my, my, my grandpa's, he was an OG, bro. <laughs> he, was, he was about the business. He was always about the business. You know, he raised up a young man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't look this way, Ed. You know, you know I, 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 I be crying for the, <laughs> my pops. Yeah, I do like that. I do like that. And it is one of the best panels of Percival where he he's not frowning but he's not smiling but he has tears streaming down his face and he tries to rub it off he tries to be mature and I love that right it's always it's always good to see characters like this characters who are childish characters who have viewpoints on other people have those viewpoints expanded have more about their caretaker revealed and see how these characters really react to that and how they feel about it I love that Nagaba once again he makes infinite questionable decisions endless like legitimately every week i just 
I just can't let it slide because there's always something new that I have to inevitably deal with. But regardless of that, it is great to see Percy reacting like this. Man, the, the dude can write some characters when he feels like it. However, with that being the case, like, never in my days have I felt and experienced some A1, top tier, top of the line, fresh off the production line, top shelf, haterade, like I get from Kion, bro. Like, how? How do you, like, how do you live with this much negativity? I, I don't know, like... I, I I was about to say, you know, I'm a pretty negative. No, I'm not. But still, <laughs> I know some negative people who could not spout this much haterade, bro. This is next level. This is actively insane. Like, you must have a problem. <laughs> you must have a problem, whether it be an internal problem, an external problem. Something's got to be wrong with you. You cannot be this much of a hater. Like, a top tier, top of the line, next level hater, bro. This cannot be the case. Because no way, bro, immediately said, uh, a first relative of Arthur, now a uh, pimp sweet from Camelot. That's a hardly a bit booster. And like, dude, dude, need I remind you, need I remind you, hypothetically, hypothetically, if I were to make a tier list right now, I just, just drop the concept of a review entirely and just make a tier list of your viability. I'd say just out of the group that you're with right now, floating in the sky, Gawain, Percival, Donnie, Nasians, Meliodas, Tri you're a fodder. Top of the line. But what good are you doing, Kion? What good have you brought to the kingdom? Because I see nothing. I honestly don't think Percival should restore your arm. I think he should have finished the job. Let's be completely real, Kaya. Let's be completely real. And I say this as because you're still my favorite member of Tristan Platoon. I say this with love <laughs> and care from the bottom of my heart. You get more of my attention than that non-character who's standing beside you, Jade. He still sucks. But you, Kion, Broski, what have you done? What do you contribute? What do you have? Your magic is reliant on other creatures. That's how worthless you are. So, Kyan, I need you to sit down, shut your mouth, and go away. You're standing right there. Don't let him talk smack to you. Teleport him to the sun. The real one. Or just put him out, what, how f tall is the atmosphere? Like, a couple couple miles. Send him up to the sky. That's where his head is. He's so darn airheaded. Put him out where there is no air. He'll probably put an atmosphere in the entire darn universe with how much gas is up in that domer of his. Come on, now. However, with that being the case, Nazians come out the like you. Everyone needs a Nazians in their life. Everyone needs a homie that's gonna stand up for them no matter what. Even if they're facing top of the line, next level, insane in the membrane level hater raid, you gotta have a boy or a girl or a whatever, an individual that comes out the clutch and is like, it doesn't matter where he was born. Percival is Percival. He is the go, except for me. And you know, Papa Pelgar. And, you know, Mel's standing right over there, but, you know, sometimes he ain't too goaded. And we can't help but talk about Escanor. He hasn't made a single appearance in this series yet outside of flashbacks. And he, unless he's a chaos creation, he never will. But regardless, Percival's the guilt, so shut up. And Kion, who once again is looking, he looks a lot more like his season one father now with the shorter hair. But with that being the case, he goes, I'll write whatever. Like, dude, Kion. <laughs> Broski, sit down. But regardless, we do get to see that Percival, now ignited over the truth of his past and his grandfather's, like, Meliodas, let's hurry and go to Camel. All right, like, I get it. I'm assuming it's just running gag at this point. Like, this is just always going to. I. Who knows? Maybe after a six year time skip or a four year time skip, or whatever, when Percival's 20 and he spent a whole bunch of time around a whole bunch of people, he's still going to call it Camel Mott. But, like, brother. Meliodas is a more complicated word than Camelot. I think it literally even has more letters. Camelot, Meliodas. Hold on one second. Bruh, Camelot's not that hard of a word. It literally has less letters than Meliodas, which is what you say just fine. Just say Camelot. I'm not sure, bro. Especially in a serious scenario like this, where he's desperate to go get revenge for his father. Well, not his father. His grandfather. And kick Arthur and his father's butts like Percival. <laughs> Say the name right, at least. Put some respect on its name. Come on, now. But with that being the case, we don't get Meliodas' response because another person speaks up first. When the moon, distant thunder, 
and reign and bless the kingdom. The four knights of prophecy will finally gather. But through an assassin from chaos and a traitor's blade, hope will be stolen away as well. And, um... Yeah, I did a really deep masculine voice for that, but it was actually Thetis. So Thetis explains that uh, that was the omen by the former King Barker just yesterday. Bro just... And just dropped that Odin. Oh, I about to say dropped that Odin. Too much God of War has been on the mind recently. But dropped that omen out, and I was like, yeah. That was the omen seen by former King Barker yesterday. Just as he foretold, a euphoria of prophecy has gathered, but our hope has also been lost. And with that being the case, obviously everyone's like, uh, wait a minute, we just got here. Our hope is lost, what do you even mean? And Derriere, <laughs> that is, but I, if this ends up not being Derriere and it's just someone who really, really looks like Derriere because of Nakama's same face syndrome, I'm gonna do nothing, <laughs> being real with you, but... Don't be shocked if I switch between Derriere and Thetis all the time, because I just see Derriere. But with that being the case, in one of the coolest shots that this character, if it is Derriere, has ever had, and if this is Thetis, just the coolest shot she's ever had, is this over-the-shoulder shot where she declares, the road to Camelot is closed. And with that being the case, everyone's like, wait a minute, so we just can't go there anymore? And I don't really get this omen thing, but if he knew the future, why couldn't he change it? And, um... Broski, do you know what the definition of omen is? Here, allow me to inform you. I will not. You're stupid. But regardless, as the characters in the story immediately say, an omen is nothing more than a vague hint to the future. It's not an all-powerful skill to see into the future with perfect accuracy. <laughs> Which really makes me wonder, like, when Bartra first awakened that power, did he just get words in his head? Well, no, I, he speaks it every time. So was he just chilling with Denzel and suddenly he was like, <gasps> On the morrow when the sun shines over the castle of the night, I shall see the darkness. That, like, what happened? <laughs> what happened when he first awoke in that magic? I literally have no idea, <laughs> but I really want to see it. But with that being the case, this vague hint to the future and this whole prophecy itself finally gets a clear, concrete explanation. We see that, according to Thetis, this power, this vague hint of the future, is unbelievably important in getting any sort of initiative against Camelot. Considering they have the literal creator on the verse on their side, yeah, any little bit of help is appreciated. And with that idea being the case and being how important it is, King Bartra, while seemingly at least near his deathbed, is... One of the main assets of Leonis. It's essentially the only hope that they have for anything in the future. And with that being the case, it re well, I guess it kind of it makes sense that the kingdom focused so much on putting Bartra under protection, having Elizabeth watch over him, having mainly just Elizabeth for the longest time. Like I said, Meliodas was never even guarding Bartra. He was just in the castle vibing. But essentially, Bartra being the target seems like it makes sense. You know, his visions are the hope. But plot twist, shock horror, the real goal, the true goal, was not actually to get rid of King Bartra, but it was actually to recover a captured comrade. However, this person who came to capture that comrade, or recap, it's a recapture, free the comrade, would be Jericho, a former holy knight of Leonis. And obviously, the Donners is like, no, he nice, Kiskina. You mean a holy knight of Leonis betrayed us? No, dumb dumb. He called the rebel a rebel because they didn't betray. Are you stupid? Never mind. <laughs> You're part of the personal platoon. You're all dumb. Except for Nasin's. Nasin's his best boy. But with that being the case, Derriere ended up putting that is that is ended up putting a very strong spell on him essentially the magical restraint that she placed on the guy was strong enough that jericho was like well can't take you with me buddy so no worry you'll die in the name of our lord and then bada bing bada boom he died in the name of their lord <laughs> she froze homeboy and just dipped and like once again why wasn't he under better protection? <laughs> like, I get now, Lancelot at the time, and I believe recently in a previous chapter, a couple chapters ago, mentioned that there's magical restraints on the dungeon and the barrier that they're in. Like, it makes sense, you know? 
there is supposed to be some sort of magical barrier around there, so I guess they figured that would be the only protection, but considering this was their one, and count them, one hope to get into Camelot, the only one, the singular one that they had, why was it not higher priority to keep him safe? Like, I, I get it, you know, he was an enemy, and thus he deserves to be chained up and reprimanded for his actions, but at the same time, I... This guy, especially considering what it's revealed that they needed him for, was just as, if not more, important than Bartra. Because he was the only key to get anywhere. Sure, Bartra can warn you of the future a little bit, but heck, unless they can somehow send... Like, I'll get into it in a little bit. But essentially, once again, I must get on Meliodas' case for just not doing anything the entire time while the commandments were running rampant. Because if he just took care of the commandments, the knights could have been focused on, I don't know, stopping Jericho. And admittedly, the strongest knight went to go stop Jericho, but the strongest knight also loves Jericho. Not in the way Jericho loved him, but still views the traitor as... And I guess, you see, I guess it makes sense, right? Because the reason Jericho was sent as the one to do the get going and the uh, removal of life was likely because she knew about the catacombs and the dungeons and probably the magical barrier wouldn't identify her as a threat and that's why she was able to get through so easily but even still I think someone as important as this prisoner should have been under much higher guard like if not if not Meliodas <laughs> himself like at least at least Guild Thunder or a Holy Knight of some variety. Like, Gila only showed up by accident. She wasn't even there on purpose, I don't believe. So, this guy being under such a little guard, kind of stupid. But the reason I'm so angry at Melios for being something, well, not being something so stupid, for doing something so stupid is the reason that slowly gets explained to us and asks, well, okay, I get you had a prisoner, but. What does a war prisoner's death have to do with the loss of hope in Leonis? And Meliodas is like, well, uh, level with you real quick. They're pretty much the exact same thing. The Knight of Chaos are given a certain mystery power by Arthur himself. The marks that are activated by their life force and an incantation of the ones tattooed with said marks. A winged man. And the thing is... It's all devised to actually open a door that connects this side to the other. Essentially, it's a portable door. And it's their only portable door. But the reason this is so interesting to me is because when you think about it, the previous entrances to the other realms were kind of one-offs. Like, there was the one portal to the demon world that we saw in Cursed by Light. You had to fall through, like, this really, really, really big hole. Which... I actually wonder why they didn't just... Like, why did Merlin actually have to open a portal? That's the other one. Then the gate to the Celestial Realm was corrupted by Melascula. Don't know how they get in and out from there anymore. Meanwhile, Arthur just has him. And obviously the Fairy Realm was the Fairy Tree. You got into the Fairy Realm through there. So it's interesting that these tattoos are able to act as kind of portable gateways to the other world. But once again... If this guy was so important, like the only one you had, why was he just isolated with no guards? At all. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like he should be a much more high priority target. Or not target. Obviously he's been captured. But like a high priority suspect to keep under watch. Like I would have had him at my side at all times. Because obviously he's fodder. I don't think this guy was very strong if he was being held back by iron chains and a little bit of magic. So if I'm Meliodas, this guy is next to me at all times. Like, oh no. He tried to get rid of me. It's almost like I was one of the strongest in the verse. And... Just keep him there. I don't know. But obviously with Homie being gone now and one of the re requirements for this tattoo to work being the life force of the individual with no life force kind of can't do anything. And all the people who could resurrect people just got slaughtered again. <laughs> so there's nothing left. And with that being the case, since this prisoner is now lost, there's no way to Camelot. Melius just flat out says this. He's like, yeah, unfortunately we got nothing. And we see that Donnie's like, unfortunately, we couldn't have anyone stop her. If that's the case, shouldn't you have just run over there? And yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess maybe you can't sense it. Like, but that seems so counterintuitive. How would you have your most valuable prisoner in an area that you can't sense? Like, in case that area ever gets invaded, if you cannot sense what's going on down there, that seems stupid. I don't know. Seems a little bit backwards on Meliodas is running the kingdom. But once again, 
I can, it's weird, I can perfectly understand this. I can justify Melius being a pretty bad king in terms of, like, managing his kingdom, being protective, all that. Because he had no real good example. What, his dad? <laughs> his dad was a good king in the general sense, as in he ran a nation. That's about it. Well, ran a species. Other than that, Melius has no experience with this. At all. He's kind of just flying by the seat of his pants. And he's probably trying to do the exact opposite of what his father did. Melius seems like a very loose and relaxed sort of individual as a king, to the point where the front guards of his gate to his literal home, like, oh yeah, Melius is just at the bar. <laughs> Whatever. Living his good life. So he seems very, very relaxed, and I'm assuming he's doing this in the same way he's raising Tristan, very lackadaisically, because his father was strict and all about the business. So I can see why Melius is like this, but at the same time, it's like, dude, why are you like this? <laughs> But with that being the case, Nasi's like, yo, 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 chill, 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 you know, you can't talk to the king like that. And he's being real. Notably, I, I do have to disagree with Donnie here, though. Like, Donnie kind of has my argument, but he's taking it from a different angle. He's like, well, th think about it. If he didn't wait for all four nights together and just went there himself, couldn't he stop this problem on his own? And that is true. But one is the four knights who are destined to defeat Arthur, not Meliodas. So I understand why Meliodas is being remotely passive around that. And two, dog. <laughs> why didn't you just take my argument? But regardless of that, we do get to see that as Donnie confirms with Percival that, hey, yo, my fault. Didn't mean to insult you, my boy. And Percival's like, yeah, I know. We chilling. We vibing. We're doing good. Percival asks, wait a minute, but there has to be a reason, right? For why you didn't go to Camelot and just take care of this issue yourself if you're that powerful. And Melodius is like, hmm, why didn't I, the demon king of Britannia, not go to Camelot? The thing that is another realm that's made for only humans. I wonder why I, a demon, could not make it. Oh yeah, I'm a demon and it's literally made for humans and humans only. By humans, for humans, of humans, on his Mubong tarp. <laughs> I, there's so many... Like, I know God of High School is something that's going to just become part of my repertoire of things that are constantly going to get referenced, just because of how much I love that series. But still, gosh darn it. With that being the case, apparently they didn't know that Melibus is a demon, and I don't know why this isn't common knowledge. Like, everyone, everybody knows, everybody knows. Like, it's not like it's hidden anymore. There's no reason to hide it anymore. I mean... Unless you're, unless Melius was afraid that there would be more people like Death Pierce who would just run off and make their own kingdom because they didn't want to serve under a demon, Meliodas is literally the savior of all their lives. This is a common known fact, and it is the case. I don't think it really matters who he is or what he is, especially considering he looks you. Like this, this is gonna sound bad, but weird reference to make. Remember the Injustice comics when Martian Manhunter died, and it was like. Yeah, they accepted the aliens that looked like them. In this case, Meliodas doesn't necessarily display any demonic traits. As long as he's in base. And he usually is in base. So, like, he's human passing. I don't know why people would be concerned. I would get it if, like, a gray demon or a red demon saved the verse and suddenly tried to play human king. I would get that. But Meliodas, he just looks like a dude. A young dude, but a dude. I don't know. It seems strange. Especially considering Anne doesn't know this, Nasi doesn't know this, but apparently Donnie does? Like, Donnie knows the room. Like, he heard about it, like, as if it were a rumor, and he says, oh, so it's true. And Percival says, really, so it's true. Where did you guys hear that? <laughs> Am I missing something? Was there some rumor spread about Meliodas being a demon that I just didn't know about? I don't know. I get Percival somewhat catching on to it, but he seems a little bit too dumb to make the connection. That sounds so, that sounds so mean. But, like, Meliodas did have a conversation with Percival in demon tongue, so I get Percival making the leap, but how did Donnie make the leap? I don't know. But with that being the case, Percival asks, like, wait a second, uh, any reason why the demon clan can't enter? And, uh, Percival, hi, you were there when Arthur attacked and molly -whopped you, so you should know. But with this being the case, that is like, here, let me love with you real quick. Being completely precise, it's the non-human clans. The demon clan, the fairy clan, the goddess clan, and the giant clan. There's a powerful barrier on the door to Camelot that prevents those four races from invading. Which makes me wonder, did they actually test this? <laughs> well, actually, no, they didn't. I don't think they did, because they literally explain it. But with that being the case, 
the more and more I hear about it, the more and more convinced I am that Nanashi is dead. I, I refuse to believe Bro's alive. Like, uh, there's no way Arthur doesn't know. <laughs> if Orlandi knows, Arthur knows. And I doubt Arthur would keep Nanashi and run his Rex. I know Arthur seems like the kind of king who would respect loyalty, and obviously Nassians is... Not Nassians. Nanashi has been pretty loyal, but look at what he immediately did to Varghese. And it seems like Varghese was around in Camelot long enough that he had a fully adult son that could have a child. He immediately turned on Varghese the moon Varghese turned on him. So I wouldn't be shocked if in his... <laughs> Nanashi's a goddess. I don't like goddesses. Goddesses must die. Like, I really think Nanashi's dead. <laughs> if he's still alive, I'm calling Arthur a massive un... Now I think about it, though, Arthur uses Orlandi, and Orlandi is a vampire. Hmm. But Orlandi, Orlandi can enter Camelot, right? Does Orlandi have a tattoo? Never mind, Nas, the Nashi may still be alive. If, I guess if you prove use... Huh, I didn't think about that. <laughs> I don't know why it just came to mind, but Orlandi is indeed a vampire. Maybe Arthur doesn't know that because Orlandi's just a floating eye. And I don't think vampires are supposed to look like that, if you're asking me the question. But who knows? We'll see. With that being the case, Melodius is like, yeah, that's why everything was entrusted to you, the Four Nights of Prophecy. And we do get something here that does seem weird and seems wrong. Because according to Meliodas, both Tristan and Lancelot are half non-human, but it looks like they're not affected by the barrier. One, how do you know that? Did you try it? Did you test that? That seems like a very important thing to test. And like, now that Arthur knows that they exist, what stops him from altering said barrier to make sure that those filthy half-breeds are not able to get into his kingdom? Especially Lance. Like, I... No, I don't. I mean, hypothetically, right? I forget... I forget how Elizabeth's biology is explained. Alright? I think... I the, the most prominent explanation off the top of my dome is that she has the soul of the goddess Elizabeth, which gives her the magical powers of it, but she is biologically a human. Like, down to lifespan, how she reacts to certain things, lack of wings, all that. She's like a biological human with the soul of a goddess. Or she's half goddess, half human. But that can't be the case. Right? Or can it? Because I think she would have to, because, right, un unless your soul... I think she, I think I'm leaning more towards the half goddess, half human thing, because it can't just be the soul, right? Because does your soul in the seven deadly sins verse get passed down? Does a portion of it get passed down with your genetics? Because if not, then Tristan shouldn't have access to goddess powers, but he does and they're quite potent. So I'm going to assume it's half goddess, half human. So whatever that makes her. So I guess she couldn't enter either. So what makes so that Tristan can enter? Like... Bro is more non-human than he is human. Like, bro has a quarter of it. A fraction. A whiff. A taste of humanity. Like, bro's barely got anything left of him. Bro's mostly demon. Probably the number one race that Arthur wants to keep out. So I'm kind of shocked. And does that mean Bond can just stroll up in there? Because, like, okay. I hate to do this to you, Meliodas. In fact, the rest of the sins, I hate to do this to you. But get Bond. Let him Hunter's Festival all of you. Get some gains up, let him run in with Elizabeth, since she's also apparently human, and have them solo the ver- <laughs> Like, literally, just have him run rampant in Camelot. I don't know why that isn't a viable option. Like, I get Meliodas not going, right? Demon. But, like, Bon? He's human. Unless, unless now his biological profile has changed enough that he's something different. I don't know. But it's- main thing I'm wor wondering about, how? How do you know that Tristan and Lance are going to be unaffected by the barrier? Because it seems more like a theory. Because Thetis goes on to say, there's nothing surprising about that. Until 16 years ago, there was no precedent for being half a different race. Most importantly, the barrier's defensive capabilities increase as fewer people are included in it. On the contrary, half-breeds are also included. What does that mean? Like, hypothetically, by Thetis' own explanation, the barrier should be even stronger against half-breeds. Because there are different species, technically. Like, a half-human, half-fairy. It's not like... <sighs> this is gonna sound so... I'm not gonna say it. But, like, when they say half-breed, they literally mean, like, two entirely separate biological species that happen to be able to reproduce with each other. Like, bar for bar, word for word. That's what they mean. And Lance... 
maybe, but Tristan, I just can't imagine. Bro, once again, is a quarter human. And if anything, the barrier should be stronger against him because he's two. <laughs> like, at least Lance is only one non-human race. <laughs> this sounds so bad. But, like, at least Lance is only one. Tristan is a two-for-one deal. <laughs> Bro has three species in him. You're telling me the barrier can't pick up on that? And once again, the biggest thing here is how do you know this? Did Varghese tell you this? If so, how does he know that? Like, what, what, I don't know. At least looking at Varghese, he seemed like a pretty knowledgeable kid. He seemed like a pretty cool cat. But something tells me he wasn't going around asking Arthur, being like, Hey, uh, my lord, about this mystical magical barrier that you erected, and notably, now I think about it, 16 years ago, meaning Varghese had already probably been gone gone, considering how old Percival was. I doubt in the six months he had before he became a turncoat and ran away from the kingdom, he was out there asking Arthur, like, Oh my lord, uh, this specifically anti-human, or no, solely human barrier that you erected around Camelot. Uh, what are its properties? How does it work? And will it accept half-breeds just in case the people that are meant to take you down are in fact half-breeds? Like, I don't know. It's strange. It's very, it's very strange. I don't know how they know this. Don't know why they know this. It's weird. But you know, whatever. I'll have faith in them. They probably know something I don't. They know a lot more than I do, so I'll let it slide. However... Speaking of people who won't let this slide, a certain someone speaks up and is like, Hey, Pops? That's? We love with you real quick. What does this even matter? Like, if the door is gone, what are we doing here? Like, it, we straight can't do nothing. At least at the moment. Like, we just gotta hope that Arthur, after witnessing Big Papa Lance, the most powerful of us all, by a long shot, saying that for the people in the back who still don't believe it, He's not going to just send out Chaos Knights, especially after he already had to execute one. And even if he does, they can appear anywhere. The likelihood of them just showing up in Leonis easy for the grab is very low. So the situation seems like uh, we're kind of done, son, unless Grandpa feels like spitting out another prophecy. And, well, I will admit... <laughs> Tristan being all negative here was kind of shocking. <laughs> Sounds like the demons I was looking at a little bit. He is spitting facts. Like, the cat, it really makes me wonder, like, how, how many Chaos Knights did our cast run into? At least just the personal side of the cast before we got to Leonis. See, now that, ma that makes Pell, oh my. See, I, I can't even blame Tristan for that, though, because he didn't know. <laughs> Melio, why didn't Melio just tell him? Oh, but then again, he was off, so it makes sense. But then again, weird things. But now I'm thinking about how Tristan let Pelgard go when he should have just snatched that boy. Lance and Tristan both let Pelgard go. They should have snatched that boy up and said, stay here. But let's see. They ran into Talisker. Talisker was at Nasians. Ironside, but there was there was literally nothing they could do about Ironside. They ran into Pelgard. Once again, nothing they could do about Pelgard in terms of keeping him around. Uh, Talisker, I think, would have been the best one. Ardbeg? But Ardbeg got off by his own homies. Speaking of his own homies, we had the Dark Talismans, but they all got off. Lance slaughtered one. Well, not one. All of them. <laughs> so, yeah. Mel, maybe you should have, like, sent out a raven or something. <laughs> like, seriously, maybe you should have provided this info. Especially considering how many Chaos Knights were easily up for grabs. Sure, you would have sacked a lot of the journey. At least with... Still not generally sure where Ironside and Pell are meant to stand right now, pre any hypothetical amps they're going to get, because, I don't know, it's weird. I feel like they have to fall below Lance, because I doubt, I don't see Pelgar doing to Arthur what Arthur got done to by Lance, if you get what I'm saying. Same thing with Ironside, just the, so if they are fearing the Seven Deadly Sins tears, or at least if Ironside, someone who may or may not be relative to Pelgar, is fearing the Seven Deadly Sins tears, Lance is in that tier, so I don't know but with that being the case if Meliodas had given them this information sooner Lance may have had to give up his game a bit quicker but I think it would have been worth it because it would have had multiple spares like imagine if instead of slaughtering all the dark talismans Lance just incapacitated all of them actually yeah he really could have especially if he knew he could have just done that because he had to reveal the game anyway the talismans had trapped him in a perfect cube so he could have just incapacitated all of them, dragged them back to Leonis, and been like, here you go, four fresh prisoners, all with marks on them. Let's get it popping. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> About to write that one if too. No, but with that being the case, we do get to see <laughs> that Thetis is like, you know, in all my infinite wisdom, I did not 
remotely consider that fact. And Meliodas is like, yeah, my son kind of spitting right now. You know, I actually am a little bit proud of you. And then Donnie's like, darn, as we finally got all four parts of Exodia. I'm sorry, I know Exodia is five parts. Leave me alone. But would that be the, be the case? Donnie's like, we got all four, but we can't fusion summon a door. I don't... <laughs> I'm sorry, I just recently got into Yu-Gi-Oh! and I still don't fully understand it. But with that being the case, we get to see that and even points out the fact that the enemy can pretty just leave, come, go, whatever. Like, if they just want to pop in and say hello and then dip, they can do just that. There's no reason for them to stick around. Then we get to see Gawain, prime suspect number one. And like, no offense. Something in the next chapter... <laughs> This, uh, spoilers, but I did read the next chapter already. Check out the live reaction to that too on Patreon. But with that being the case, I'm looking at Gawain and I'm like, mm, some some shady because she doesn't say anything. She just has a hand over her mouth like he's considering a possible solution. Lancelot doesn't have a word. Isla doesn't have a word. And like once again, Kion, top tier pro like he's a human though, so I guess he'd be fine. I guess he really doesn't care. <laughs> uh, yeah, he just doesn't care because he says ah, so much for a night of prophecy. <laughs> Except for a Tristan night. Um, you know, I thought I sold was a Tristan meat rider until I met Kion. But seriously, bro, top tier grade one hater raid. You should go bald. I no, I think can we just call out the spare Percy again? Like for the reals, can we just call him out and just let let him work his magic <laughs> to say the very least on Kion. He's earned it. However. With this being the dark, dim case. Yeah, and like, I, I Jade, Kion, I, I, who, who is, who is the Jade and Kion of the original? See, the thing is, no one, like, drew my ire like they did. <laughs> or at least they had, at least, then again, my experience with Seven Deadly Sins was, I think I dropped in, like, I spawned in at the verse in terms of reading it around when season one came out. And I believe the last, when I, I remember getting caught up around the second Vizal fighting festival with the commandments, like, right before Melly got packed. Like, that's when I caught up. Because I remember waiting week for week, week by week after week. From that point on, that's my first main memory of Seven Deadly Sins be like, oh, oh, I'm itching. Where's the next chapter? So, so in terms of like characters who I needed to wait for a glow up on, there never necessarily has been one. I guess you could say Elizabeth, but I was always mostly indifferent to her. She never did anything that like directly drew my ire. And to be fair, Jade hasn't. Like Jade is he's a he's a crossfire victim for being associated with Kion, and that's why I just want to reach into the narrative, grab Kion by the neck, and just shake him, shake him. I only want to shake him, and by neck I mean shoulders. With that being the case, as Jade is like, man, this air is the worst. You know, this depressing aura. Kion, feeling validated, is like, oh, ah, this air is the best. Okay, I can't keep doing that. That actually hurts my <laughs> Weirdest reason ever, but it actually hurts my nose to do that voice. But we see that everyone goes to comfort Percival. And Percival, you know, he he's like, um, let me level y'all real quick. Y'all all stupid. Let's get this journey on, know what I'm saying, know what I'm saying? And... Everyone is a bit confused, like, uh, journey, like, into the unknown, like, we, we can't do that, Percival, that's copyright struck, and <laughs> we see that everyone is either in shock or amused at this individual for his statement, and he's like, well, if you guys really think about it, if the Chaos Knights can just spawn in, we ran into, like, Sam, I ran into one twice. I packed a couple, Lance packed a couple, and some of Arthur's own men packed a couple. They're obviously roaming around still. And where are they roaming around this big old beautiful continent we call Britannia? And I know it's not a continent, everybody who's listening in, but I'm going to call it a continent. So reasonably, why don't we kill two birds with one stone? And by that, I mean I'll just keep dying so I can get amps, so I can be as strong as Tristan and then Lancelot. And then at the same time, we can see the sights, get the views, do all that good good. Maybe drop by the Fairy King's Forest. I can go get some games with Bon. Then drop by the other Fairy King's Forest and go get some games with King. We can make this work. And with that being the case, even if we don't find another holy... I was about to say something horrible. <laughs> we don't find another holy individual. Bada bing, bada boom. We can find another way in the Kami Mob. So while you're safe, fellas, 
Why don't we get going, huh? 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 Don't make me life drain Kion again, because I'll do it. And I'll do it for the free. And we do get to see that uh, as Meliodas laughs, he's... I love how Kion looks mad at his uncle. Oh, no, Tristan laughs. And Kion looks mad at his cousin. Still so weird saying that. But that being the case, Meliodas is like, wow. You know, Percival, you really are Timothy Herner. He who may bring hope to this world. And, you know, that's nice. That's neat. That's fine. That's whatever. You know, I, I like it. I like it. Interesting how, like, nothing... Like, were they really just playing to give up? <laughs> I know Tristan brought up a very valid fact. But, like, was it really just... Like, no one mentioned that they could just wait for King Bartra to spit some more bars? Like, no one mentioned that they could just travel and look for them again? Like, I get it. The, Arthur should likely be on high alert now that the four knights are gathered. At least one of them is a viable combat threat. But, I don't know. <laughs> it, seems, it seems a little bit forced, so that Percival is the hope of this adventure. But, you know what? I think it works. I think it works. Overall, I really like the chapter. I think it's pretty solid. It does a lot of explanation, really. It gives us a lot of... Not necessarily backstory. Well, it gives us backstory on Varghese, explaining the whole connection he ended up getting to Leonis. It explains the marks and the emblem that Percy has had that he got from Varghese. It also ends up giving us, giving me hope in terms of chaos not being fodder, but at the same time, taking away hope and the idea that chaos or Kath will probably be the final villain again or a Chaos Clan or whatever, and not Arthur, because apparently he was changed the moment he got Chaos's powers. Ew, booty beat, I hate that. But whatever, you gotta do what you gotta do. But also, getting this lore about the half-breeds, their mixed genes, and the reason why Meliodas and the Sins don't just roll up on Camelot. Still don't know why Bond can't do it. Still don't know why Bond can't do it. Mel, don't know why you didn't call up Bond immediately. Hit him with the ring, ring, bring, bring, and be like, Hey, yo, Bond, let's flutter him. Oh, 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 oh. But, but neither here nor there. I think it's a pretty solid chapter. However, that's what I think. Please, so much you guys think in the comments section down below. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Make sure you hit that little notification bell so you miss out on any videos that come to the channel. Also, also, I do a Patreon down below. We can support for as little as one. Count them one dollar a month to get the exclusive videos, early content, and more. Thank you so much for watching once again, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. This is that guy with the pencil, writing off.